didn't present the word. Yes, and I apologize in advance for not being able to be with you. Um, the uh, social scene in Francis Stray is uh, is very uh, very uh, difficult to handle, and the strikes are there. So that's why I'm staying here in Strasbourg. But I'll take this opportunity to present uh, what I believe is an interesting intersection between spintronics and quantum thermodynamics. And by the end of this talk, I hope you will. Um, have a gra grasp over what uh, this schematic could mean and what the uh, Maxwell demon in this uh, in this schematic is. Before I begin, I wish to thank uh, colleagues uh, for the work provided here, both on the permanent uh, staff level, but also several PhD students here uh, and a master's student who are presently working on this topic, and uh, several collaborators, both experimentalists and theoreticians and naturally funding, most recently, the PVPSP uh, that was accepted. Um, as a uh, background, one should note that when one does spintronics at the molecular or atomic level, one usually uses uh, either a lateral strategy that you can see here with the, uh, say, yeah, so, Sorry, Martin, excuse me. Can, can you try to speak louder or increase your volume? Because we, we cannot do that here, actually. So Yeah, in that case, I will... Uh, let me see what I can do. Hold on. There's no volume button on our side. <laughs> um, just a second. Ah, maybe, yes, I found it. Okay, sorry. Try again. Is it better, is it better now? Yeah. Great. Well, okay. wonderful. Because I can't see it on my side. It's okay, it's okay. I, I, found, I found the volume button on our side, so it's okay. <laughs> um, as sorry, I about was, that. sorry about that. Uh, as I was saying, um, there are several techniques to um, do molecular atomic spintronics, and uh, in these cases, you usually use lateral junctions, as you can see up on top, or um, uh, vertical junctions using an STM tip, and you're studying molecules or individual atoms. In these cases, the transport path is very well controlled. You see it. Uh, through your uh, visualization technique, for example, STM, and you can control the uh, decoherence due to the interaction between this uh, quantum object and its environment. So, for example, in the valence Doppler group, um, the nuclear spin is being preserved um, relative to electronic paths. And uh, in the case of STM, for example, in the Heinrich group, uh, an MGO decoupling layer is used in order to um, study the individual electronic properties here of an iron ad atom. In both of these cases, one achieves a Zeeman splitting of the, um, of the paramagnetic state through an external field. And so this also requires low temperatures and or high fields. So in the example of the Heinrich group, you can see that for their equivalent, uh, their effective out of plane field here, they have a splitting, a Zeeman splitting on the order of 100 milli uh, micro EV and a maximum temperature for reasonable experiments to be performed of about five Kelvin. So in this context, I want to propose another path um, to achieving the same sort of physics and essentially how to craft what I call practical quantum resilience. And to do so, we begin by using a ferromagnetic metal whose um, TC is about a thousand Kelvin and whose um, atoms inside the, the, the the bulk of the layer experience a field of about a thousand Tesla. And the goal is to project this effective field onto a paramagnetic center. So um, one example is if you use a molecule with say manganese center, you can get um, magnetic coupling between the center and the underlying cobalt layer at room temperature. Uh, in a study we reported now several years ago, if you have a chain of such spin sites borne by molecules that are stacked, then that spin chain will also align um, along the direction of the magnetization at room temperature. Uh, you could also put a spacer layer. For example, here we reuse the prototypical cobalt, cobalt copper system to show that the central site of the molecule is now aligning with uh, the cobalt site, but according to the rules of interlayer exchange coupling. Um, a second aspect of our strategy is to control the decoherence environment. And for this case, we are using what is called a spinter phase. The spinter phase represents the additional uh, states that appear at the Fermi level, and I'm showing here calculations, upon 
uh, moving a molecule into contact with a ferromagnetic surface. And these states are highly spin polarized and they have a low uh, spectral extent and spatial extent as well. And essentially now, if you use that spinter phase to interact with a paramagnetic center, this sort of schematic explains what is going on. So you have a paramagnetic state with spin degenerate levels and the electronic interactions between this spinter phase with high spin polarization and this level is effectively to spin split these states with an effect. And basically it, it amounts to an effective field. And so the transport fluctuations that at equilibrium describe the state are being borne by only here spin down states. And this is uh, what is causing the spin splitting. Um, now, practical uh, in practical terms, and several talks have alluded to this before, it is interesting to do spintronics using magnetic tunnel junctions in the vertical uh, geometry if you wish to deploy these so-called spinter phases. And so I won't get into all of this. This previous speakers have described it before. I do wish to state that um, one can look at trying to introduce paramagnetic centers into MGO barriers, such as carbon. Um, of course, then the problem is that you need to be able to control um, the position of those um, atomic sites in MGO, and that's not so simple. Um, we have new results that appear to indicate control, and you'll have to stay tuned for them. Another solution is, as you have hinted at before, to use magnetic molecules because you can uh, more easily handle the paramagnetic center that is borne by the molecule. But of course, the question of junction technology arises because there is at present no industrial molecular compatible nanojunction process. And in this context, I wish to emphasize the leadership that the CNRS has through a process that the UMP has developed and used on molecules since 2010 and a process that we at the IPCMS have more recently come up with. And this process takes entire stacks uh, consisting of two ferromagnetic electrodes separated by here a cobalt phthalocyanine molecular spacer. And through a series of processes, uh, we can make junctions that are uh, anywhere uh, with between 300 and 500 nanometers in diameter. And so this is what the final uh, junction looks like in a first step of processing that we've performed. Um, I should add that thanks to our setup here, which allows for rather large substrates, we are now able to pr uh, process 35 by 35 millimeter wafers. And now instead of uh, you know, just a few junctions, we can process up to 1500 junctions at a time. Um, I note that uh, in these junctions, um, whether macroscopic or microscopic, because the nanotransport path involves tunneling, any sort of impurity state or localized state, such as the ones we wish to study, will generate a hotspot of nanotransport. So although we have nanometer-sized or micron-sized devices, the transport is effectively taking place over a uh, local nanotransport path that needs to be determined relative to rather well-known uh, strategies such as those that I've outlined before. So quickly, in brief terms, I'm going to describe to you first what happens if you place such a set of chains on uh, a ferromagnet, and basically you have a very high effective field that is aligning the spin states of each of these um, paramagnetic centers forming a spin chain. And so if you do so, what happens when you study magnetotransport is that as the um, spin chain is promoted from a ground state to an excited state through um, uh, inelastic uh, conduction path opening here, as you can see in the conductance increase, along with this conductance increase appears a new term in the magnetoresistance corresponding to a new coercivity here. And this tracking of the um, conductance really provides a basis for evidence that this me mechanism is in place. I invite you to read the paper if you would like to see more information on this. Uh, this is a rather unusual feature of molecular spintronics that does not have a counterpart in inorganic spintronics. Now, turning to the topic at hand, I now wish to discuss what happens if you put in a spacer layer and therefore reduce the effective magnetic field on these sites such, such that they are no, their spin referential is no longer fixed in space, but begins to fluctuate. 
Um, to do so, I will uh, introduce these first results that we obtained in collaborations with colleagues at uh, the Institut Jean Lamour on MGO junctions with these cobalt carbon spin interfaces of um, nominally high spin polarization. And on this particular pillar, we observed something that we were not expecting. Um, the IVs, as you can see, are in the so-called power generating quadrant. You have positive bias, negative current, and this negative current appears to depend on the orientation of electrode magnetization. Uh, note also that there is no shifting of this curve to accommodate for any extrinsic offsets in order to have all of the data remain in the two power dissipating quadrants. So this MTJ pillar is outputting power, and this power is of electric spintronic origin. Now, how, why is this happening? So we are proposing the following explanation that rests on an extension of thermodynamics from the microscopic to the quantum information regime. Now in thermodynamics, uh, as you know, a system at a temperature T can accept a quantity of heat Q from a bath and output work. And um, to do so, our end entropy is produced as a result of the process and this entropy is, is here in these equations designated by sigma. And sigma is always positive. In the um, overall system, entropy is always increasing or zero. And this is the second law of thermodynamics. This second law has been generalized to take into account not only fluctuations, i.e. the system can come out of equilibrium, but also uh, what is called a quantum information. And so this sigma now has to be, uh, to it has to be added the quantity i. And i is the mutual information between uh, a measurement unit and the quantum unit who's, that is being measured. Um, and as a result, more work can be extracted and with a feedback mechanism. And this feedback mechanism is uh, in, the, uh, yeah, in vulgarization terms called the so-called Maxwell demon, a demon that in this particular case as invented by Maxwell, could um, measure the speed of uh, molecules and decide whether to open or close a trap door such that without apparent work, it is possible to separate hot and cold baths. And nowadays what is understood is that this Maxwell demon must be taken into account in the overall system and that it has thermodynamic uh, quantities itself that need to be taken into account. So in this context, uh, work has been proceeding on um, uh, mesoscopic and even atomic engines to try to study these processes. On the mesoscopic level, you have electronic engine, engines that uh, use electrostatically confined uh, 2D electron gases to form quantum dots. And so you could have two quantum dots here, one transport quantum dot, where we are working here with a puddle of 100 electrons and working between the N and N plus one levels. And the shuffling of electrons here is determined through capacitive coupling to another quantum dot whose levels are being uh, emptied and filled through thermal fluctuations. And the goal in these sorts of experiments is to break the detailed balance of transport in order to generate an active uh, uh, voltage difference. And you can, of course, also play with the two temperatures on either side and therefore determine efficiencies. Now, these sorts of engines, at least electronically, uh, require low temperatures because of these large number of electrons involved, and they usually have these low asymmetries. It's difficult to completely block these channels. And you know where I'm getting at. Spintronics is very good at blocking spin channels. That's what spintronic performance is all about. Um, on an atomic level, on the other hand, there are uh, very interesting results showing that these um, quantum resources, namely, for example, quantum information the way I did detailed uh, previously can lead uh, to uh, additional work being performed. So I'm providing here the example of the NV center in diamond subject to laser induced uh, optical strokes from the ground state to an excited state. And then in this particular uh, implementation, the return to the ground state leads to a population inversion. The zero state is more populated than the plus one state. And so when you then apply a um, work stroke using a microwave uh, source and you achieve a rabbi oscillations on the system, the resulting fluorescence is has additional um, intensity precisely due to this uh, inversion of the population. And so in 
In this community, the, part, the, the term to be said is that this population inversion is a so-called quantum resource that adds additional work capacity to the system. Note, however, that of course, this implementation requires a lot of auxiliary equipment, such as lasers or microwave sources. So in this context, I can present uh, what we think is going on with that result that I showed you, namely that uh, what, is, what is happening is that we have paramagnetic centers that can be coupled to one another, and they are uh, subject to an effective field through transport fluctuations generated by highly spin polarized electrodes. And the detailed balance of transport is being broken because precisely of the spin polarization. So the um, spin referential here is being set by this interface. So the color code is correct here, spin down is blue. And this uh, transport line is not available precisely due to spin conserved tunnel. So I can present to you elements of quantum resources, resources that are present in the engine. And we are working on a first uh, analytical model of how this engine can work. So um, in this engine, as I've said, spin polarized charge transfer is generating this spin split state. And it is also squeezing the block sphere of available states uh, for the paramagnetic center by virtue of the effective applied magnetic field. So essentially, you know, minus one zero zero and plus one zero zero are more favorable than other, uh, than other uh, tra quantum trajectories here. Um, the second thing to consider is that this interaction of electrons going from the spinter face to the paramagnetic center and splitting in the process amounts to setting the quantum state of the system. And this uh, setting is occurring by virtue of the low density of states with um, localized uh, properties, both spectrally and spatially, and high spin polarization. So you're injecting spin coherence, and there's a number of papers in this field that explain that this sort of setting can amount to a quantum resource that can generate additional work. The reverse stroke is even more interesting uh, because then the system has evolved from an initially determined state to a non-determined state with a quantum superposition of spins. When it is measured, i.e. when the electron comes back, you know that it was, for example, here minus one zero zero. And this measurement of the working substance of the uh, system is essentially a form of, uh, of the spinter phase acting as Maxwell demon and providing additional uh, work of quantum origin. So if you're interested, these papers provide good avenues to understand what the concepts behind uh, the statement are. Another key aspect when you perform quantum measurements is that um, they have an entropy cost, uh, which is KVT log two, and you need to pay that price from an entropy standpoint in order to erase the information you've provided so that you can uh, enter another cycle of the engine again. And what we are proposing, and this is part of the research underway, is that uh, the ferromagnetic state of the electrode, which ultimately accepts the electron, um, be responsible for this resetting and that this be um, advantageous because the um, um, ferromagnetic state is a particular uh, state of matter in which uh, entropy can actually be decreased through enhanced ordering. And so this is uh, uh, one, of, I think, one of the key ingredients for why this engine works. And so basically, uh, you have um, potentially heat from the outside coming in and uh, being dissipated through these uh, rectification of spin fluctuations here and being transferred to the ferromagnet, which then returns to the ground state. Um, there are other quantum resources that I can get into. One of them is the magnetic coupling between centers. Um, I wish to emphasize that we've uh, performed um, DFT calculations to try to estimate what the bandwidth and the frequency of this hopping mechanism, this attempt frequency is. And so um, what we can see from the uh, density of states on the cobalt side of cobalt phthalocyanine with uh, spin one half pointing out of plane and the um, atoms here of carbon on top of the C60 molecule acting as the spacer layer 
is that we have a bandwidth of about 45 millieV. And so this corresponds to a very fast stroke frequency in the hundreds of terahertz. Um, and this frequency is important for us because if you compare that frequency with the phase decoherence, the faster T2 time of phase decoherence on the Cobalt PC site, it's in the megahertz range. So we have a system with a high degree of quantum correlations between uh, the uh, non-thermal baths that I've described, those are the spinter phases, and the paramagnetic sites. Um, my student, Mathieu Lamblin, is working on an analytical model in which uh, he is subjecting a fluctuator to both quantum vacuum fluctuations and also to bosonic fluctuations, i.e. phonons. And he's looking at this in the context of a cycle that he's describing in this way, in which the measurement stroke, i.e. the uh, spinter phase induced return of the electron and the measuring of the quantum state of these two uh, intricated uh, spin qubits is being broken. And then there's a thermalizing stroke, which consists in reestablishing this quantum entanglement. And his calculations are showing that you can get a net positive delta E out of this, i.e. that you can extract energy from the quantum measurement. So now to experiments, because this is all nice and dandy, but I wouldn't be saying this if we did not have rather unusual results to back up this um, proposal. Uh, so we performed um, molecular junction stacks, and this is the stack, uh, typical stack that we've studied. And as you can see, we have three monolayers of cobalt PC and spacer layers. Note that they are asymmetric so that we can uh, imprint a spin referential from uh, a dominant spin referential from one of the electrodes. So we, on these sorts of stacks, can observe spontaneous currents or biased voltages that are here constant over two hours at a rather high temperature compared to what we talked about before. Um, and in addition, if you um, measure the resistant, the slope resistance on these devices as a function of applied field, you can extract uh, magnetoresistance properties leading to very high spin polarizations, which is also a requirement for this engine. Um, note as a result that depending on the voltage applied, it's possible to have non-zero current in the anti-parallel state and zero current in the parallel state or vice versa. So you can have a switch type property present here as well. Uh, the most spectacular aspect of our results come when one looks at the uh, junction derivative, conductance derivative, and one sees spectral features as low as here 0.2 milliEV on our MGO-based junction, despite KBT being 25.4 milliEV. So you have a spectral resolution that is 100 times better than KBT. This was also observed on our molecular-based junction, as I show here. And this sort of noise reduction has been seen before in both quantum and classical systems. It is usually the hallmark of a feedback mechanism that effectively uh, focuses transport uh, despite the thermal smearing. Um, the other interesting feature is that if one looks on the molecular system at the output power as a function of temperature, and we're represented it here on a log scale versus one over T scale, one can extract uh, slopes for energy activations, and one sees a break at 120 Kelvin uh, in this output power, which um, could correspond to the magnetic phase transition of the cobalt PC spin chain. And to prove this, uh, we actually performed uh, ESR experiments on a related stack. And what I'm showing you here on the top is a typical spectrum where one sees the uh, multiplet of cobalt appear. And we are tracking its uh, intensity as a function of temperature. And one sees a breakaway precisely at 120 Kelvin when the um, AF fluctuations uh, uh, transform from being the dominant contribution to being a secondary contribution. So as a final comment, um, if uh, one were able to uh, make these sorts of pillars, say with MGO, and it's measured 0.1 nanowatts at 300 Kelvin that we published a few years back. If you were able to make these into a matrix, as uh, we've seen previous speakers describe, then you could achieve a uh, aerial power density that would be quite competitive relative to other forms of energy harvesting, whether it be direct solar 
or up to artificial forms of energy harvesting. And note that with our latest COBOL PC based results, we are substantially increasing this power output. So the take home message is that um, indeed solid state junctions, if you want to do quantum physics with it, well, they're not model systems and they're essentially a partial black box, but they do have advantages. And one of them is the spin interface, which uh, can craft uh, practical quantum resilience and for which we are reporting high values of spin polarization, including at room temperature. It also, in our concept, represents a quantum thermodynamical resource that I've described with um, ultra-fast um, uh, injection of uh, um, quantum coherence. We believe that thanks to it, we are able to study uh, a spintronic engine that has terahertz quantum correlated strokes and can operate autonomously on chip beyond room temperature. And I've just detailed to you two experimental tracks that we are investigating right now. And so this uh, raises the more general question of whether um, quantum physics and its quantum computing applications could be retooled in order to perform energy harvesting that could be useful. Um, and so to this extent, for us, the work ahead will be to um, test um, concepts such as putting temperature sensors on our uh, junctions in order to extract efficiencies and apply external levers such as uh, in operando microwave excitations of these two spin states. And we also wish to isolate certain quantum resources. For example, we wish to uh, study what happens when the ferromagnetic state transitions to the paramagnetic state, what the impact on this electronic picture is. Uh, more generally, we need um, experiments to come from atom level of electronic physicist on model junctions, say using spin STM or ESR STM, because they can help us to extract uh, values such as this spin splitting as a function of whatever spacer you decide to put in. And so for this reason, I've uh, penned a comment inviting that community to join the game. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'll take questions. Thank you, Martin. Aha, uh -huh. yes, thank you for the exciting uh, speech. Uh, I have to confess way beyond my area of expertise, but I see some questions over there, so. <laughs> thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So uh, just a question, when it, the matter is scavenging work from uh, fluctuations, uh, at least in the classical case, the, the key to understand the thermodynamic meaning what you are doing are fluctuation theorems, okay? Yarzinski, uh, Galavotti, Cohen, Crookes, depending on the protocol. So fluctuation works typically when people get quantum, the first, first thing, thing you have to do is to verify if fluctuation, classical fluctuation theorem are somewhat violated. So did, did you have some, because I didn't see reference to fluctuation theorems here. Uh, do you think you will do some noisy measurements or something in this sense? That's exactly where we're headed. Um, and that's the sort of work that we're doing on MGO with carbon junctions. Uh, noise fluctuations are, part and parcel of the, uh, the palette of tools that we can apply. Uh, keep in mind, however, that um, when, we, um, when these devices work, um, fluctuations can actually become very small. Um, and so I refer you here to the DIDV graphs on devices that work. Uh, when they work, there is almost no noise. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, uh, so in that sense, uh, we will, we will be doing it when on devices that do not work. Yes, we extract uh, fluctuation uh, regimes and we can study them. Uh, and we would like to extend that to devices that do work. And, but you're, you're completely right that uh, um, testing fluctuations theorems would be, would be good. Um, this was actually contained in the uh, theory slides that I showed, but it was, it was hidden under the card. Okay, and another question. This is maybe a naive question, but the, there were a physical review letter 
couple of weeks ago, I think. Uh, when I see something, some two level system uh, engine, uh, something like that, the first thing I, I, uh, I'm wondering about is uh, uh, negative, the role of negative temperature because you have a system where uh, uh, in certain many situation you may have entropy uh, reducing over uh, an input of energy so uh, do, do you have uh, some something do you see something in this sense in your uh, in your uh, study here well um, the study itself will not show this directly but the theory that goes with it is essentially uh, going in that direction. Uh, what we're saying is that uh, um, uh, the, the measurement stroke ultimately um, reduces the entropy on the, uh, on the, quant on the uh, working substance. Uh, and so you have locally a negative temperature and you locally have a second violation, a violation of the second law. Mm -hmm. Uh, but of course, if you take the overall system, there is no violation. So, um, so the, sh the short answer is that I, I think you're right. And uh, we need to craft um, careful experiments in order to be able to demonstrate this explicitly. Thank you. No other question in the audience? No. No, but I have one in the uh, very much. Uh, of a more of an engineering uh, question uh, because all the all the structures that you shown they they seem relatively easy to to fabricate am i right or so um so uh, yes and I, I was wondering what what is the 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 cobalt pc i didn't get that is that something that you have to synthesize or you you you, you buy it or <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, cobalt phthalocyanide is a pigment. It's very easy to find. It's used in inks. Uh, this is a this is a commercial molecule that uh, chemists okay. have no interest in, and we can just buy it. We can purify it and, and use it. Um, if we use molecules, as I explained here, we can elegantly insert these paramagnetic centers within the tunnel barrier of a junction. However, then you still have to make the device and. Uh, Making nanoscale devices with molecules is tricky because they are sensitive mm. to solvents, to water, and so on. Uh, so yeah. if, you can, if you can make it, then you can you know you can elegantly work on the system. Of course, uh, from an industrial or applied standpoint, it's much more interesting to work with MGO as the workhorse for spintronic mm. devices, and that's why we have a second track in which this time we are trying the much more difficult task of controlling the insertion of carbon atoms into MGO at precise positions. So not okay. only precise yeah. within the thickness of the barrier, but also relative to one another, because you, mm. uh, in the end, in this design, uh, you wish to have uh, pairs of these uh, paramagnetic centers with a magnetic coupling between them. So the, the first paper that we came up with in 2019 describes uh, a lot of the physics behind what happens with MGO with, uh, with carbon sites in it. And um, as I've said, we are going to be uh, publishing a paper on junctions with MGO carbon um, in terms of what happens to uh, quantum physics when you play with individual uh, carbon atoms as well. Okay, thank you very much. So let's thank again, Martin for his speech. Thank you.